You know, there's no evidence that Mayor Pete took care of that bridge in Baltimore all by himself because, you know, he's very concerned about racist roadways. But there's also no evidence that he didn't do that. We're going to talk about the catastrophe in Baltimore Harbor and why it's an indication that the grownups actually aren't in charge right now of this country. Also, Trump had a huge day in court yesterday, fought back against the press and is winning in more ways than one. It's cash money in the bank right now for Donald Trump, and we'll tell you all about it. And the ladies at MSNBC, that includes Rachel Maddow, and the ladies of The View, they're still very upset, very, very upset about that one Republican who just got hired over there at the Peacock Network, and we're going to tell you all about it. Hey, everybody, and you too, Chuck Todd, because I know you're watching, because you've got Google Alerts set up, and anyone who's talking about you, you get very interested in it. Sorry for ruffling your feathers yesterday, but we're not done. We're brought to you by the Electronic Payments Coalition. I'm Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. You bet we're focused on that bridge collapse in Baltimore. The rescue efforts are still underway. Heroic, heroic Americans right now braving cold, rough waters to try to get to whatever possible humanity can be salvaged from that event. And and yes, we're going to talk about the political ramifications of it and this overall sense that things are just crumbling in this country. And why is that? We do want to talk about that. But before we do, please know that we are praying for everyone who is affected by this incredible disaster, the families of those loved ones who are still being salvaged right now and hopefully rescued in the river. Uh, of course, we're praying for them and praying for the great first responders who are doing heroic work right now. No doubt about that. Also, we're once again streaming live at Rumble right now. And if you're joining us live, please contribute with your comments. We read them, we watch them, we love them, and we'll interact with you however we can. If you're watching us after the fact, please like, subscribe, turn on notifications. And also, if you get a minute, share the video that you're watching so that other people can join the family. Our audience is growing every single day and we appreciate it. Yesterday, Donald Trump did in fact have a pretty good day in court. We we broke it for you here at the beginning of the show where his bond was in fact reduced uh, by a significant amount of money. He's still appealing that bond and the ruling itself. And I just want to reiterate because a big theme of these initial segments we're about to do on Donald Trump's day yesterday has to do with the fact that that our justice system appears to be so incredibly biased and so incredibly corrupt in certain regions of this country. And it's a debilitating, debilitating fact for so many Americans because there's one thing that we should all feel like we can rely on, and that is a fair shake from justice in this country. I mean, it's one of the things we were founded on. And in this case specifically, the idea that Donald Trump has to pay over a half a billion dollars in fines and penalties to a New York court where there is literally no victim at all in the supposed crime. And 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 all of this has been determined by one man. Judge Engeram has been judge, jury, and financial executioner. Donald Trump has not been able to make his case in front of a jury of his peers. It's been one judge who's determined the entire thing. And yesterday, as we mentioned, a uh, Court of Appeals in New York smacked down the exorbitant fine that he put forward against Donald Trump. After that hearing, Donald Trump met with the press. And I think one of the reasons so many of you like Donald Trump is because he fights back with everyone, including the media. So let's watch a few of these clips. This is a case that could have been brought three and a half years ago. And now they're fighting over days because they want to try and do it during the election. This is election interference. That's all it is. Election interference. And it's a disgrace. will obviously be appealing. But this is a pure case of voter intimidation and election interference. And it shouldn't be allowed to happen. This case could have been brought by the DA, but they didn't want to bring it because they said they have no case. And then they bring it anyway. As you know, DA Bragg did not want to bring this case. He was forced into it by 
for outside reasons, and it's a disgrace that it can happen. If this was a case, it could have been brought three and a half years ago. And they decide to wait now, just during the election, so that I won't be able to campaign. It will be appealing this, or the other decision. All right, so that was, uh, by the way, a commentary on his other day in court in New York, having to do with the the fraudulently titled hush money case, which has nothing to do with hush money. We're going to get to that case a little bit later, all right? But but put a pin in it, and we'll watch that part of this impromptu news conference again, just so you'll be reminded. But now he turns to the case about the, uh, the so-called bank fraud. Uh, it will be my honor to post, and we'll post whatever is necessary, whether it be cash or security or bonds, because uh, Decision. We appreciate uh, and respect the appellate division very much, and uh, we will, I think, uh, do very well in that whole thing. We have a judge who I believe is a crooked judge and a crooked attorney general, absolutely crooked. We did nothing wrong at all, 100%, and that was proven, and everybody there said it was proven. All you have to do is read the legal scholars, and you see that it was proven. But we will continue with that. But we appreciate very much the decision uh, of the appellate division. Thank you very much. What's your collateral for the bond? Cash. Is your elected when you party? There's, there's something pretty iconic about that. Donald Trump turned it back around his shoulder and just staring right at the press. Cash. He'll post it in cash. Yeah, and he's got a little bit of cash at his disposal. We'll get to that in a moment as well. Later on in the day, though, he had a more formal press conference and took questions from all comers about this decision and about what he plans to do. Mr. President, you mentioned the cash you had. You said on Friday was something like $500 million. You intended yeah. to put some of that into the campaign. Now that the bond's been reduced, are you going to start putting money into your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. 2016. Well, first of all, it's none of your business, I mean, frankly. But uh, I, might, I might do that. I have the option. Oh, that's again a snarky little reporter. Now that you have, you don't have to free up five hundred million dollars in cash, and it's only. I love it. what reporter says it's only one hundred and seventeen million dollars. Now you can free up some cash where you put it into your campaign. You haven't done that since twenty sixteen. Trump, it's none of your business. Notice how Joe Biden's never asked any of these questions. Hey, Joe, all that crack money that your son's sitting on in his jockey shorts during his latest drug binge. Why don't you? Pump some of that money into your campaign. Of course, Joe Biden doesn't need to do that because of all the corporate money backing him and keeping him employed. Uh, but it's it's notice how obsessed they all are with Donald Trump's money. It's it's freakish to me. I mentioned yesterday, it's like they're watching some sort of weird political porn where they get off on the idea that Donald Trump has to surrender his money. The the jealousy, the envy, the insidious and destructive envy that these people feel about Donald Trump, the way they rip him apart and demonize him, really exposes how, frankly, jealous they are. They want to be able to live the life that he lives. They also want to be able to say whatever the hell they want, like he does, and get away with it. And by the way, they're angry that he gets away with it because up until this moment, up until the Trump era, they were the ones who decided that careers were destroyed or not because uh, somebody says something that they didn't approve of. You see, everything about Donald Trump undermines the media and the lefts and academia and pop culture's power in this country because they were the ones who always get to decide who gets away with it or not. And in some cases, who gets to be rich or not. And Donald Trump, through their envy through their insidious and destructive jealousy has to be destroyed. That's why they're so obsessed with money and all of the questions about his money. All right, a little bit more. Can you give us a little bit more detail about the timing of when you plan to secure the bond and how exactly you're planning to pay the bond? Well, as I say, I have a lot of cash. You know I do because you looked at my statements. I mean, you've been examining my statements for a long time and I have much more than that in cash. But I would also like to be able to use some of my cash to get elected. They don't want me to use my cash to get elected. They don't want that. They don't want me taking cash out to use it for the campaign. And they looked at it, and this judge looked at it, and he's part of the whole deal. 
And why well, he's such a disgrace for this city. Again, the most overturned judge. There's never been that we can find a, a case where a judge has been overturned now five times. It was four times. Now it's five times. That's right. And and by the way, and, and to that question, can you give us a little bit more detail on the timeline of when you're going to secure the bond and free up the cash for it? And the only appropriate response to that is, who the F cares? Why, why are you so interested in this? Here, here's what's going to happen. I have to post a bond. I have a deadline to post the bond. I'll post the bond by the deadline. And if I don't, I'm pretty sure everyone will know about it. Oh, tell us about the timeline on this. As Andrew Breitbart used to say about the media, hey, hey, mainstream media, the American people don't hate you because you're liberal. They hate you because you suck. The bias is the least of the problems. Who cares? Who cares what the timeline is? But Trump is absolutely right. This has nothing to do with alleged criminal behavior or defrauding anybody. This has to do with the election. If Donald Trump weren't running for president, you know that this case never would have been brought. You know how I know that? Because Letitia James, the attorney general in New York, literally ran her campaign on a promise that she'd go after Donald Trump. Think about that for a minute. You know, there have been times when attorneys general or or U.S. attorneys or or district attorneys, they've run for elections by saying, you elect me and I'm going to crack down on drug crimes, or I'm going to crack down on violent gangs, or I'm going to crack down on the mafia and the mob, right? The group of crime that is insidious, that deteriorates a city or a community or a country, or goes after an industry, things like that. You know, kind of go, elect me and I'll go after the, the prostitutes that are soiling our good city, that sort of thing. But I can't remember one time that somebody running for either attorney general or district attorney isolated, focused, and targeted on an individual American citizen. Vote for me and I'll get this guy. I'll get this guy and he'll be behind bars. And as insidious as it is that people won elections with that mandate in places like New York, even more embarrassing, destructive, and deteriorating for our culture in this country is that you don't hear much from other lawyers. You don't hear much from other district's attorneys. You don't hear much from the American Bar Association saying, you know what, we're better than that, people. We have a code of conduct. We have ethics. And you know why you don't hear that? Because they're not better than that. Shocking to learn that lawyers are pretty much corrupt across the board. I'm sorry if you're a lawyer. But until I say otherwise, that's how we should all respond. All right, here's a little bit more of Trump yesterday. Again, fighting, fighting for himself, and by extension, fighting so that he can run in the election so you have a chance to vote for him. So, of course, he's fighting for you because these prosecutions are not about Donald Trump. They are about you. They hate the way you vote. They can't throw you in jail yet. So they're going after him. You mentioned the cash you have. You said on Friday it's something like 500 million. You intended yeah. to put some of that into the campaign. Now that the bond's been reduced, are you going to start putting money into your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. 2016. Well, first of all, it's none of your business. I mean, frankly, but uh, I might, I might do that. I have the option. But if I have to spend 500 million on a bond, I wouldn't have that option. I'd have to start selling things. I don't have to sell anything. Because I'm a, it's a phenomenal company. Look, I built a phenomenal company. Someday they'll actually report that. I built a phenomenal co company that's very low leverage, unbelievably low leverage, with a lot of cash, a lot of everything else. Why should I let a crooked judge make a decision to give $450 million? That allows me to spend very little money on my campaign, if I so choose. I'll be spending money on my campaign. I might spend a lot of money on my campaign. But I should have that option. A crooked judge shouldn't say, we're going to have you post a bond and take all of that money that I could be spending on a campaign or other things if I want to do other things. So we were gratified by the professionalism of the opinion today. I thought it was a very, I think it's a very important opinion for New York. But uh, the only thing that's going to really solve that problem is when I win, because you're going to have to win. Because no company is going to be coming to New York if I don't win that case. That case is a scam, it's a sham, and it's a hoax. 
Yeah. And uh, I want to expand on that idea in a little bit about the only way you solve this is if he wins because he's 100 percent right. Uh, but as you know, the question about, well, gosh, if it's this judge and it's that attorney general and we found out that district attorney didn't even want to bring charges, but then he ended up bringing charges. Why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And Trump goes there. He goes there and tells you exactly why it's happening. Sir, but back to the trial here in three weeks, do you plan to testify and are you the which which hearing? The trial hearing. I don't know that you're going to have the trial. Well, I don't know how you can have a trial like this in the middle of an election, a presidential election. And this is again, this is a Biden trial. These are all Biden trials because Colangelo works for Biden. Can you imagine they take a guy out of DOJ? And they put him into the attorney general's office and then into the Manhattan DA's office to go after Trump. These are all Biden trials. So I don't know that you're going to have it. I think we're going to get some court rulings. Yeah, please. Yeah, they are all Biden trials. And uh, the dirty little secret that was underreported is that uh, people left Merrick Garland and Joe Biden's Justice Department, took a leave of absence and then went to work in the district attorney's office for Alvin Bragg months prior to the charges coming against Donald Trump. A revolving door between Joe Biden's lawyers in the Justice Department and the lawyers working in Alvin Bragg's office to go after Donald Trump. This entire thing, obviously, is a political operation. And when the American people see that the court system and the rule of law is being used as a political weapon against an individual who is currently the presumptive nominee for president, it makes you feel like we're in a third world country. Because we just might well be. I love this country. I have full faith and hope that eventually the good guys win. But I never thought it would get this bad. Did you ever think it would get this dark? Did you ever think that the political enemies of a person that was president of the United States and enjoys the support based on the last couple of polls of half of this nation would have to face this kind of force, this kind of persecution, this kind of attack from judges. I never did. But we've got good news and we've got some hope on this, and we'll get to that coming up a little later in the program. Uh, but first, I do want to talk about our good friends over at handsoffmyrewards.com, where you need to take action today if you haven't already. See, there's good things in this country that the free market has created that we love and we enjoy them. And then the government comes in, they meddle with it, and they rip it away from you. And in this case, I'm talking about credit card rewards. Millions of Americans earn, use, and enjoy and rely on credit card rewards. Corporate mega stores right now, they want to take those rewards away. Rewards we use on groceries and school supplies, what small businesses use to, to grow and that we can use to save on our gas. And Lord knows we need that. Travel miles we use to make memories. The Durbin Marshall credit card bill making its way in the Senate right now would eliminate credit card rewards. No more travel miles, no more cash back. When lawmakers go out of their way to help corporate mega stores line their pockets, it ends up hurting American families. So tell your senator to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com. That's handsoffmyrewards.com. All right. Uh, Donald Trump's lawyer, Helena Baba, showed up last night on Jesse Waters' show and pushed back bigly against the attorney general of New York. I want you to see this. It's good. Again, uh, not only is Trump fighting single-handedly but he's assembling people to fight on his behalf. That's a big part of how Donald Trump goes about his business. He wants to make sure he's got fighters. But what happened today? We won. <laughs> you know, no, we didn't win. You know when we'll win? When we get this all reversed, which is what's going to happen. So what happened today was that Letitia had to eat every single tweet she has posted since the day the twisted order from Judge and Gorin came out with the ridiculous number, with the disgusting injustice on the American people, not just Donald Trump. And I would love to see what she tweeted today because she was having fun posting the interest on a man who has done nothing wrong and a family who has done nothing wrong every single day. And then the appellate division came in and said, Sorry, due process still exists in America. You still get a right to keep your assets until we get to review what all these lawyers are saying was wrong. 
11 weeks, I have never seen something, Jesse, like I saw in that courtroom. It was a travesty on the justice system. And I am so proud of the appellate division for giving us the opportunity. They didn't reverse the case, but they will when they see what we saw. It was a disgrace. And today, there was a little bit of faith in the American system uh, that, that I've lost over the past few years, I'll be honest with you. Do you think Tish James and Judge Ergeron, do they, do they feel ashamed, a little embarrassed? Have they felt, I don't know, maybe did they overreached a little bit after this decision? Well, that would mean that they have a moral compass or a conscience, and I don't feel that that exists. People that go on TV, censor Donald Trump, shut him off when he's speaking, want to act like he's about to go broke, want to act like he's poor, and that's why he couldn't get a, a bond that no private company has ever been asked to get with no cash equivalents other than cash marketable securities. People that get excited for that, they don't have a conscience, Jesse. But, you know, I hope she took a little piece of humble pie today because that's what was served to her. Just a little. But we'll be we'll be serving a lot more of that in the next couple of years. And uh, she'll be eating humble pie. You'll be having birthday cake. We hear it's your birthday. So happy birthday. Thank you, Jesse. That was cute. It's cute. His lawyers are cute. What do you want? Jesse Waters is also cute, by the way. No offense, Jesse. I don't mean to single out Trump's lawyer there. Uh, happy birthday, indeed. Yeah, listen, it's fun to see a victory lap. I, I mean, it's amazing to me that it is a victory, and she's saying we won. But think about this for a minute. We won because we only have to put up, what, $120 million instead of the outrageous $500 million they were demanding. Yeah, it's a win, but it's not really a win until justice is actually served here. It's fun to watch the victory lap, though. It's fun to see smiling faces. It's fun to see people happy. You know what's more fun? You know what's more fun than that? Watching the MSNBC meltdown. And they weren't very happy yesterday. You want to watch? I know you do. I mean, I, I, honestly, this is so infuriating, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> I don't even know if I care what the process is that these judges are arriving at. Whatever it is, it's flawed. I can tell you that much. I mean, da David put it well. It's this is a different process for, for for this person. We have decided that he gets his own private court of justice. He has a private plane. He has a he has private clubs that he lives in. You know, apparently, you know, he he basically fashioned himself his own private militia to try to take over the Capitol. You know, now he's getting uh, his own private system of justice. Uh, do you remember what I told you about envy? the insidious, destructive envy that eats away at these people's interior. You just saw it perfectly displayed. He has his own private jet. He's got his own private clubs. And now I guess he's got his own private justice system. These are sad, miserable, angry people. And understand what they're upset about right now. They're upset that Donald Trump only has to put up 120 some million dollars on a fraudulent case that should have never been brought in the first place. And they're up. We wanted his half a million billion. Excuse me. We wanted his half a billion. Damn it. And now we've been denied. What? A, uh, and by the way, by the way, did you did you notice the book on his shelf over his uh, right hand corner there? What's the name of the book? Taking down Trump because he must be taken down. They're still under the delusion that this is Donald Trump. If we just get rid of Donald Trump, everything will be fine. We'll go back to the time when the Republicans are nominating Mitt Romney and we can control him. He's malleable. You know, oh, I mean, except when he's running against Barack Obama and then we'll call him a racist, sexist pig who kills people who have cancer because he denied them health care. But still, they're good little Republicans who will sit in the corner and do what they're told. We just got to get rid of Trump and then everything can go back to normal. And of course, you and I don't know otherwise. Uh, you and I know that the issues and the, the, the agenda for America first is not going away, number one, because we see through it all now. And number two, we also know that we will not tolerate a candidate who will go back to the namby-pamby, well, you know, I like Barack Obama personally. We just happen to have disagreements about this country, but I have no doubt that he's a patriot and he loves this country. Really, I have some doubts. 
I have serious doubts about that. And when you look at the policies that the Democrats and the left are promoting right now, undermining our allies, undermining our culture, undermining our schools, undermining our children's identities, pushing sexual issues on five-year-olds in our public schools, I have serious doubts whether they love this country or not and whether we can just respectfully disagree with these fine men and women. And you and I, we're not going to tolerate candidates like that anymore. They have another thing coming if they think this is just about taking down Trump. Uh, that said, let's watch the rest of this clip because it actually gets even better. Own private system of justice. This is an absolute travesty. It would not happen for anybody else. Anybody else it would be like, sorry, buddy, you lost. Pay up. For him, he gets his own set of rules. Legally, Tristan, how is that done? We just saw it. They just decided that they just, you know, the appellate court has now just decided they're going to swoop in and just change it. And that's it. And now the uh, the AG's office can now try to go up above them, I believe. You know, I don't know what the details are because you just told us. I'm guessing this is coming from the first department, uh, appellate division, first department. That's the intermediate mm -hmm. court here in New York. Uh, that would be issuing a decision here. Uh, I don't know if there is a remedy for the AG's office to go up to uh, the Court of Appeals, which is our high court here in New York, and try to get them to uh, to basically countermand this order. Uh, but in my view, this is, without knowing more, unless there's some sort of other extenuating circumstance that we're going to learn here, this appears to be an absolute gross miscarriage of justice. All right, so... Here's what I want to discuss about this, because, yes, it's fun to watch the meltdown. But there's something incredibly destructive about what we just saw. Uh, that guy, by the way, what is with cable news that they no longer that you see the Chiron underneath? Is it still up on the screen here? Let me uh, get to my money. Yeah. So on the Chiron there where it says breaking news appeals, you know, that space has now become the little Chiron space. It looks like, you know, what a NASCAR driver wears with all these different patches and things that they're selling and promoting. You got your QR code over there to download the app and you got your time and you got your stock ticker and you got this. And that used to be used for one reason and one reason only to let you know who's on the screen talking right now. And they don't use that's the last thing they use it for now. Drives me nuts. That's Tristan Snell is his name. Tristan Snell is not just some person with an opinion. He's not some lunatic. He's actually a former assistant attorney general for New York. In other words, this is a person with some level of supposed expertise and objective observation on the law and how things are supposed to happen in this country legally. But of course, MSNBC only hires him because he's got a political bias that you just saw obviously manifest in his complete and total meltdown. I raise this because if you flip the channel, you'll see, let's say, Andrew McCarthy. I just interviewed Andrew McCarthy on my morning show in Washington, D.C. on WMAL. You can find the podcast if you'd like. We put it out there every day. Andrew McCarthy is a former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. So here we've got Tristan Snell, former assistant state's attorney general in New York. And I've got over here, Andrew McCarthy, the former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, both New York lawyers, both working at really high levels, state attorney general, U.S. attorney. And both of them will give you polar opposite observations on what happened in court today. And they're both called legal analysts. So they're analyzing the law, right? If you go over to CNN, you'll see Jeffrey Tubin from the waist up, thankfully. And he's a legal analyst. And he'll give you his legal analysis of what's going on. But back over to Fox News, you'll see Judge Janine, who is a former judge by the name. And she'll give you her legal analysis. And because of their political perspectives, they'll give you a completely differing idea on what's going on. It's happened in the law. It happens in medicine. It happens in science. It happens in everything.
It happens in sports where everything is shot through the personal political lens of whoever happens to be on television talking to you. And it's impossible to find objective fact anymore. I'm sorry. Tristan Snell's view that this is a miscarriage of justice because Donald Trump only has to pay $125 million today versus Andrew McCarthy saying it's a miscarriage of justice that the charges were ever even brought, let alone one judge making this determination and levying a half a billion dollar fine. They can't both be right. And this is the problem, especially when it comes to things like medicine that we saw during the pandemic and the law, as we see the deterioration of what used to be the sterling Justice Department, a shining city on the hill atop the planet that other countries were envious of. We've now seen it dragged down and destroyed in the muck of political activism. And when you see this, you think, how can we fix this? How can we keep the FBI from being used as a weapon against people politically? How can we change the court system so a judge can't do this to an individual? How can this be fixed? I've been asking myself this for years. And it reached a point this morning where I realized there is only one way to fix it. When you look at, at the current public narrative, where every single one of these once vaunted institutions, whether it's American academia in our university system or the American entertainment industry, which again was the envy of the world and replicated and duplicated worldwide, whether it was our, our music industry or our film industry or what have you. When you look at our legal system, when you look at criminal justice and law enforcement, all of these things that have been twisted and warped as a political weapon on behalf of the Marxist left in this country, and it's all focused, for the most part right now, on this one man who represents defiance to that machine, and it's Donald Trump. From the news media to Hollywood to the court systems to our universities, and yes, to even ESPN, they're all lined up on one side and they're all trying to drag down this one guy. And I got to tell you, the only way we win, the only way we fix it, the only way it changes is for the American people to stand up and do what we've done since before we were even a country. And that is defy the powers that be, hoist a very large and defiant middle finger to those authorities and say, hell no. You're lining up all of this power to defeat this one man. The only way we stop this and fix this is to make sure that one man wins. This isn't even about Donald Trump being the president anymore. This is about stopping this chaotic machine from steamrolling all of us. He's just got to win. He's just got to win. Hey, Larry, can I jump in and make a yes, point? Yes, sir. Here? Please, Kevin. So go back to the beginning of this video. There's something this guy says, Tristan, where he tells on himself. He, I'm going to paraphrase, but it's something along the lines of, at this point, I don't even care about the process anymore. I just want the result. Oh, Which really? Exactly oh, my God. Thank about. you for catching that. But that's the perfect tell. That's exactly what they're doing. Again, this is a former assistant attorney general in the state of New York. Let's listen. I, I, honestly, this is so infuriating. I don't even know what to do. I don't even know if I care what the process is that these judges are arriving at. Whatever it is, it's flawed. I can tell you that much. I mean, D David put it well. It's This is a different process for, for, for this person. We have decided that he gets his own private court of justice. Yeah, I don't even care what the press says. How did they reach the decision? I don't care. They didn't reach the decision that I want. And so it doesn't matter what their thought process was and what the reasoning was. You're right, Kevin. It's absolutely, it tells you everything you need to know. We're going to use these tools and these weapons at our disposal to stop this guy. And honestly, listen, I understand people who were hesitant to vote for Donald Trump. I Listen, I, I know Whenever I say that, people are like, why don't you love Trump? Really? You don't see why people can be a little bit resident about Trump? I mean, he, he, he's sometimes a pretty crass, obnoxious, rude guy. You know, he's a New Yorker. That's how New Yorkers are. 
And there are still a lot of people in this country who remember Ronald Reagan as their president. He's just like a nice, amiable guy. And even if you disagree with him, it's hard not to like him. Donald Trump isn't that, okay? And so it is hard for people sometimes to step up and say, well, yeah, I don't necessarily like him, but I like what he does. And I like the results. Well, honestly, even if you don't like what he does and like his results, if you like this country still being free and not having this out of control machine that can just squash not just an individual, but an entire political movement, then you got to stand up. I mean, what we need is a movement of people who say, I don't like Donald Trump and I'm voting for him come hell or high water. That's what we need right now to send the message back to these people. And I want to I want to throw some hope your way, if I could. Because Donald Trump's other day in court yesterday had to do with the so-called hush money, right? So-called hush money. Where Donald Trump entered into a perfectly legal non-disclosure agreement with Stormy Daniels before his campaign, which is something that almost every male politician does unless he's been 100% faithful. And I'm not saying that Donald Trump hasn't been 100% faithful, but there was somebody who was ready to sell a story to the National Enquirer to make his life miserable. And her name was Stormy Daniels. That was her stage name. Although, to be fair, I don't think she actually appeared on stage much if it didn't involve a poll. And Stormy Daniels' lawyers walked up to Donald Trump in his Trump Tower office and said, listen, we're going to tell this story and we've got people buying it. There's one thing you can do to kill the story, and that is write this check and we won't say anything. And Donald Trump is like, well, this story isn't true. <laughs> and the lawyers are like, yeah, I know, but here's the thing. Here's the thing about a fake story about you, Donald Trump. There's lots of reporters who will tell that fake story about you. So all we got to do is cash their check. And by the time you dispute the story and by the time the truth comes out, well, the election will be over. So what are you going to do, Don? And Donald Trump, like many other politicians, said, make this go away. Michael Cohen, make this go away. And well, that was probably a bad hire on Trump's behalf. And now this whole non-disclosure agreement that is a perfectly legal executed document that she violated, by the way, uh, is now being used as a weapon against Donald Trump to try to take him down further. The Manhattan district attorney is saying that Donald Trump violated election law. And you may be wondering, well, wait a second, isn't election law a federal crime, federal elections commission, the FEC? And you'd be right. But of course, Alvin Bragg has twisted the law in such a way that it will be overturned. Trust me, this one ain't going anywhere either. But he got a judge to sort of look the other way and allow this indictment against him. And so after that decision, he met the press, Donald Trump did, and he said this. This was a case that had been brought three and a half years ago. And they decide to wait now, just during the election, so that I won't be able to campaign. I will be appealing this. On the other decision, uh, it will be my honor to post. Yeah, so, and he's absolutely right. They, they're they doing this and they've, they've moved. You know, yesterday's hearing, by the way, had to do with, a hundred thousand pages of evidence, exculpatory possibly evidence against Donald Trump that they never turned over to his defense team. And so his lawyers are like, what the hell? Where are all these documents coming from? We need time to go through it before we mount a case. And the judge said yesterday, not only is he not going to uh, uh, impose a sanction against the prosecutors for withholding a hundred thousand pages of evidence from the defense lawyers, but he's also going to move ahead with an April 16th trial start. So they've got, what, three weeks to go through all of these documents. And all of those documents, by the way, came from the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York when they were contemplating these charges, and they decided, yeah, Trump didn't break the law. They still gathered 100,000 pages of evidence against the man while he was president. They decided not to press charges, and now the district attorney in Manhattan decided, oh, no, no, we think he did break the law, even though it's not in his jurisdiction. And all of that evidence never got handed over to Donald Trump. You see what I'm talking about here, right? So how does this give you hope? How does this make you think, oh, it's okay, we're going to win in the long run, we're going to win, we're going to win, because it seems so insurmountable? I'll tell you a quick story, because something else happened in Trump's world yesterday. 
You remember all through his presidency where Twitter was was silencing him and censoring him and deleting his tweets and threatening him with deleting his account and banning him from Twitter. And and after January 6th, they just decided to do it. That's it. We're banning him. He was president of the United States and they banned him. And of course, everyone said, oh, it's an assault on Donald Trump. No, it's an assault on us. You see, we, the people, we deserve the First Amendment so that we can get a free flow of information. It's not about Donald Trump not being able to tweet whatever he wants. It's about us being able to read what he has to say. It was an assault on us when Twitter did that. But they banned him. This is pre-Elon Musk, of course. And so what did Donald Trump do? Well, he said, screw you guys. I'm going to start my own social media company. And he did. It's called Truth Social. And they tried to stop him from doing it. They tried to put pressure on uh, uh, surfer, server companies from actually providing the servers for it. They tried to put pressure on the app companies like Apple and Amazon or uh, Google uh, to even uh, make it available. But uh, he won that fight as well. They tried to, and then they mocked it and they made fun of it. Oh, it's terrible. It's horrible. No one cares. No one uses it. No one is, is a, a joke, right? And they mock it relentlessly. Yesterday, the merger of Truth Social with a holdings company, uh, was finalized. And today it went public under the sticker code DJT on the NASDAQ. DJT. And as you can see there, see that? I mean, I'm no financial expert. But I'm looking right here, March 26, that's this morning. And the company had been trading at about uh, a little over 50. See this right here? See that sort of spike there? I think that's good. I think that's good news when a stock does that, don't you? They're saying right now that Donald Trump's share in this company that he'll be able to cash in six months after the merger could be worth over 3 to $4 billion. He owns 58% of this company, I believe I saw. And it's trading under DJT. You think people are going to buy that stock just to have it, just so they can say they invested in DJT? I think maybe, yeah. But understand something here. Trump got completely banned from Twitter. It was a travesty. It was an outrage. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. But listen, Twitter can do what they want. They're a private company, right? Even though they were colluding with the FBI and the Justice Department and people inside the government to silence people and censor people. And it got even worse when Joe Biden became president. But they can do what they want, I suppose. Sure. So what did Trump do? Trump said, screw you. I'm going to make my own thing. And now not only was he been able to get his word out through his own social media platform on True Social, but he just cashed in three years later to the tune of three plus billion dollars. You know what's right. You focus on what's right. You keep your head down. You keep plugging away. You keep working. This is still America. This is still America. No matter how much they want to tear it down, no matter how much they want to ruin it and rewrite it and refashion it and remold it through your children and through your grandchildren, this is still America. And while we still have this fight in us, we got to keep focusing on it because then we win. And that's the only way we fix this is that we fight and we win. Birch Gold uh, is uh, the Birch Gold Group, by the way, is a proud sponsor of this program. And we're proud to have their sponsorship. And they've been looking at the financial arrangements right now in this country. And it's not strong, as you know. The experts thought we were going to be in a, the clear right now, anticipating about six rate cuts by the feds this year, but that did not happen. Why? Well, because inflation is higher than expected. The Fed just met. They did not lower rates. They said, maybe we'll have three cuts this year. Maybe not. You want to rely on the Fed for your financial future? This isn't going away. The U.S. is $34 trillion in the hole. Yet we keep printing money after money after money. It pushes the prices you pay every day even higher. So you can either bury your head in the sand or you can do something about it. 
right? Sort of the theme of what I was just talking about. Diversify a portion of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge fund. I, excuse me. Let me rephrase that. It's not a hedge fund. Birch is your, gold is your hedge against inflation. Always has been. Birch Gold makes it easy to own. They help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. And you don't pay a penny out of pocket. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers. You can trust Birch Gold, too. All you need to do to get more information is text the word Larry. That's me. It's also the name of our show. Text Larry to 989898. Get your free info kit on gold. Then you can talk to a precious metal specialist on how to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text Larry to 989898. All right, the fallout of the hiring of Ronna McDaniel over at MSNBC continues. And last night, this person got to have their say. It's Rachel Maddow. Is it there? Is that the appropriate? I, I'm not sure where things stand with Rachel Maddow. I want to play it safe. I'll just leave pronouns out. Rachel Maddow had Rachel Maddow say. And I just want you to know, that this isn't really about partisan politics. It's not about Ronna McDaniel being a Republican. No, 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 no. This is about election interference. And this project is now ongoing, right? Now the project is to tell the American people that those efforts around the 2020 election were righteous. That 2020 election, it wasn't okay. Those election results were not correct. We shouldn't believe American elections. We shouldn't believe American elections are real elections. American election results should not be seen as real. They should not be respected. That's the project now, right? Hold on. I, I'm just, I just, I, I'm going to let you finish, Rachel. I just need to chime in here and just know exactly. Are you referring to the 2016 election when that's all we heard from Hillary Clinton and Jamie Raskin and Adam Schiff? And you, for that matter, for many years after the 2016 election, claiming that the election was stolen due to Russian interference. You remember, that was you, Rachel. I know you very well. And all of your colleagues, of course. Is that the election you're referring to, that American elections cannot be trusted because the results are being rigged by Putin? Oh, oh, it's the 2020 election that you're you're now daring. This. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. And it's not the 2004 election when you and John Kerry and all the Democrats said that Diebold election <coughs> voting machines in Ohio were rigged to help George Bush and the military industrial complex? Or was it the 2000 election when you said that the entire thing was rigged because Clarence Thomas and the Supreme Court overturned the recount in Florida and the hanging chads? I, I can't keep it straight. Because those elections, you assured all of us were not to be trusted, those American elections. The hypocrisy is so strong, but I'm gonna let you finish. Like I said, I'm gonna let you finish. I mean, it didn't work to overthrow the government the last time, but as long as you can build on that first effort, as long as you can keep up the anti-election mythology, then you are priming your people. You're priming the American public to not accept the results of the next election either. You're telling them that they're gonna need to take power by other means, because the election isn't gonna be how we do it anymore. You're also priming people, honestly, to, to vote to give up this supposed democracy we have, because what good is it anyway? Right? So what are we really losing if we, if we decide we're going to lose this? Who cares? Elections are fraudulent here anyway. Who cares if we give them up? Well, you know, Ronna McDaniel getting hired by MSNBC or NBC News suddenly brings this out of these people, that that's how dangerous she is as chairwoman, as, as a pretty feckless and ineffective chairwoman of the RNC, and this is how they're reacting. Like, it's the end of it all. By the way, if, if we've all been primed to just take back power by whatever means necessary and who cares about elections, then why are we participating in this election at all if we don't believe that elections can be trusted? All I talk about on a regular basis is vote, 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 get out there and vote, overwhelm them with your votes. You know, if we felt more confident in our process, there wouldn't be any concerns afterwards. Maybe, Rachel Maddow, if unlike places like, you know, South Africa and Afghanistan, we had election results on election night, we'd feel a little better about the process going forward. Maybe you should worry about the fact that people don't trust the results because of the process in place right now. 
But no, we're not going to spend any time focusing on that. You understand that as she talks to her audience, who is exclusively a group of people who already agree with her, what she does in painting Trump supporters, Trump voters, Republicans in general, understand, in fact, let me rephrase that. This isn't really about Trump or Trump supporters. It's the Republican brand because we're talking about Ronna McDaniel here. <laughs> Imagine if MSNBC or NBC News actually thought about hiring a conservative contributor who actually had a pretty strong and effective message. I mean, no offense to Ronna McDaniel. I don't want to kick her while she's done. If anything, I'm here sort of defending her. But, you know, if I wanted to pick somebody to go upset the apple cart over there at the Peacock, she wouldn't be the first on my list. And that's the point. You see, this is about Republicans. It's about you if you dare to vote Republican. And what she's doing in communicating this to her audience, exclusively not Republicans, is she's making you the enemy in your own home. If you know someone in your life or in your family or extended family that watches MSNBC and is liberal, this is what they're getting. They're being told on a nightly basis that you want to violently overthrow the country and do away with the democratic process and any elections going forward. That's what she's saying about you. And, that's, and she's saying it to your friends and family members who watch. You wonder why we're so divided in this country? Do you ever notice when we talk about politics here on this show? And honestly, I want to say most right of center platforms, whether it's at all of our town hall sites or whether it's in talk radio. Generally speaking, when we criticize Democrats, we're, dem we're criticizing elected officials. We're criticizing the people who are in power, whether in the government or in places of influence and power like academia or entertainment and what have you. It's not about the individual Democrats who have a picture of John Kennedy on the wall because that's how their families always voted or loved Barack Obama because he made them feel good about themselves. It's not about them. They're wrong, but they're not the problem. But see, for her, for the, oh, I used a pronoun, I'm sorry. For NBC News, you are the problem. That's what she's communicating here. And I, that's a look. And she and it continued. And this is a difficult time for us as a country. And I think that means we need to be clear eyed about the implications of it. Difficult times make for difficult decisions. We are contending with something we've never had to contend with before. In the news business, yes, we are covering an election, which we do all the time, but we're also covering bad actors trying to use the rights and privileges of a democracy to end democracy. The chief threat among them now is not the rioters and the kooks, but the slick political professionals who are turning their considerable talents to laundering violently revolutionary claims that America's elections aren't real, that election results aren't real, and that they shouldn't be respected. We are contending with this now, not from William Dudley Pelley's brown shirt militias, right? But from the multi-billion dollar massive political operation of one of the two governing parties of the United States of America. And that's new. <laughs> and, and with our country up against something that daunting and that scary and that dangerous for, for the country, I think bad decisions will inevitably happen. Mistakes will be made. But part of our resilience as a democracy is going to be recognizing, us recognizing when decisions are bad ones and reversing those bad decisions. So that's uh, Rachel Maddow on NBC News, basically using her power. I think she may be the highest paid person, at, certainly at MSNBC, maybe at NBC News uh, writ large, uh, using her considerable power and influence and her legions of brain dead supporters uh, to basically force her executives at NBC News to reverse their decision and get rid of Ronna McDaniel. And it's a pretty amazing thing to watch. The lunatics are running the asylum. There was not one voice behind an anchor desk on MSNBC yesterday that said, you know what? 
I, I, as much as I disagree with her and even dislike her, I think that her voice should be heard because she happens to represent half of the country. Yeah, see, that's really the crux of it, isn't it? The question that needs to be asked to anybody on MSNBC who is uh, flexing all day long, uh, crawling over each other to try to be the loudest person decrying the Ronna McDaniel hire, is that who would you accept? Honestly, who would you accept? And the answer is nobody, because they want to have a one-sided conversation. You see, it's a lot easier to demonize your political opponent as a radical kook, I think she just said, a kook, a violent kook. And she used that word for the people in the streets, not for the people in the boardroom and not for the people in the Oval Office. No, violent kook is the person who stands up. And this is what they called you when there was a Tea Party movement, too. This is what they think of any conservative when you get political active, politically active. You're a violent kook and you need to be silenced. That's why when you post things that you believe on social media, it gets deleted or censored or shadow banned because you're a kook. And it's a lot easier when you're on air at MSNBC to call half of this country a kook when there's not one person sitting there in the room with you who then says, actually, you know what? These are all very good people. They love this country and they see it being destroyed. And I'd like to take the three minutes you allow me in this one-hour program to voice my opinion that reflects what many people out there are thinking. They, they won't allow that. They refuse to allow it. How good are your ideas if you need to silence any opposition to it? The answer is not very good at all. And there's another perfect example of this phenomenon over on ABC News on The View. You know, say what you will about Meghan McCain. And I know that, she, listen, Meghan McCain does not like Donald Trump, did not vote for Donald Trump, and will not vote for Donald Trump. Why? Well, because her dad is John McCain. And I got to tell you something. Uh, how can I put this? If Donald Trump said about me the things that he said about Donald Trump, excuse me, let me start that again. If Donald Trump said publicly about me what he said about John McCain, I would be happy to know that my daughters would be angry about that and wouldn't vote for Donald Trump because of it. Honestly, it makes it's I'm sorry, it's kind of a personal thing. But if you set that aside for a moment, if you think about Meghan McCain's time on The View, she actually did an incredible job speaking on behalf of the people who vote for Donald Trump. There was more conflict and opposition on the panel at The View with regard to Donald Trump during the Trump presidency, voiced by a person who didn't even like Donald Trump. But she was at least able to be that person in the room saying, you know what, you guys are saying this stuff, but you're missing what's going on out there in this country. There are there are a lot of women who are watching us right now in Ohio and in Iowa that think very differently, and they think that you're the problem. You're sitting here in Manhattan in your comfort, and you're making fun of them, But and that voice is no longer welcome on The View. Think about that for a minute. And so yesterday, we had them basically confirming exactly what they're method of operation is, which is the Ronna McDaniels of the world are no longer welcome to be heard. Why? Because they speak on your behalf. Watch. Mm. So I leave it to y'all. What, what do you think? Look, I think she's a shapeshifter, uh, and she says and does what's convenient for her to say and do when it's convenient. She's uh, from Michigan, where the name Romney which is her name she used to use. When she was in Michigan, she was a Romney. When she became the RNC chair and it was under Trump, who did not like Romney, she took out the word, the name Romney. When it was convenient for her to amplify the things that Donald Trump was saying, to amplify the conspiracy theories, to gaslight journalists, to malign journalists, she did that. Now that she's on NBC, she's changed her tune. So I think that Chuck Todd, 
uh, is very right in calling into question on the air. And I and I and by the way, kudos to NBC for having Chuck Todd giving that, that Chuck Todd had the freedom or felt he had the freedom mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to say that on the air, just following that. The head of N uh, NBC uh, News is a very good friend of mine from Miami, Cesar Conde. I've known him for over 20 years. I think this was a mistake because um, you're allowing somebody who was part of the machine, right? A figurehead, a household name, reinvent herself. And, and I do think that there's credibility issues and, and it's up to the host, the journalists, the staff, the viewers to, uh, to, um, to make it known if they are unhappy about it. Well, yeah, thank you, Newsbusters. But see, here's the point. Uh, you let her on the air, you let her voice her opinion, and then you've got 20 people on the panel saying, yeah, you're wrong about that, and here's why. Why is that hard? Why is that hard? But we've reached a new point now where that person's voice can't even be heard. You know what they call it? They call it uh, deplatform, or, or uh, uh, you can't give that person a platform, right? I'm angry at NBC News for even giving this person a platform. You know what that means? It means I'm angry at NBC News for even letting that person speak. I refuse to hear that person's voice or opinion. We cannot give them a platform. Again, I ask the same question. If your ideas are so good, then why can't you? they stand up against one voice in the room? And over at The View, the one voice that they allow from the right is Alyssa Farah, who is a virulent anti-Trump person who doesn't do what Meghan McCain does. She doesn't even go that extra step to say, yeah, you know, but the I may not like Donald Trump, but the people actually deserve to be heard. Nope. Nope. Not on The View. So here's what she had to say. I mean, kudos to Kristen Welker, who did, we didn't see all the interview, but she did a great job challenging her. She's an incredible journalist. And one point in that interview, Ronna McDaniel starts talking about all these election officials who felt intimidated because they didn't want to certify the election. What she failed to mention is the countless of us who told the truth about the election and faced intimidation and harassment and people with a lot more power than myself, like Shay Moss and Ruby Freeman and Rusty Bowers, who we know of, who simply did their job to move forward with the election and had their lives torn apart because of it. I feel very strongly, obviously, that there needs to be Republican representation in media. We represent 50% of the country, but there are credible Republicans who never dabbled in this dangerous lie that Joe Biden didn't legitimately win the election, who would be far better served for NBC, could offer the same expertise, but with more credibility. I think of people like Chris Christie, Chris Krebs, Sarah Matthews, Mick Mulvaney, Will Hurd, yeah. to give her this platform when she was such a contributor. She hosted that insane RNC press conference where they- By the way, any of those uh, Republicans who just got named by Alyssa Farah are probably like, thanks a lot, man. Yeah, because I want to be a Republican that's approved by Alyssa Farah. I want to be a Republican that the view would consider acceptable. NBC said, sorry, Cindy, in the, the, when they announced the hire, they said, we do need to represent more voices. I agree with that. But you cannot have election deniers being uh, given these types of roles in major network news. She was someone that, you know, continues to actually plant while saying she believes uh, President Biden was elected fairly also kind of mm -hmm. towing the line with some stories about things that weren't right. And when you have 60 court cases that say there was no evidence otherwise, you have to come. Questioning election is fine. Yeah, that's a lie. There aren't 60 court cases that said there was no evidence of uh, misdeeds during the 2020 election. You had court cases where the judges said, listen, you either don't have standing here or there's uh, no jurisdiction here or we can't move forward from this because I'm not in a position to overturn an election. That's not the same as saying there's no evidence. And by the way, they're behaving as though the 2020 presidential election was conducted in some sort of pristine, perfect way. Are, are you kidding me? First of all, I don't remember Ronna McDaniel being this tip of the spear on so-called election denial. But I do remember her saying this is an unprecedented election with ballot processes we have never done before in the history of our country. Do you know why she said that? Because it's true. And all of the protocols they put in place because of the pandemic, the the vast amounts of mail-in ballots and the changes in how a mail-in ballot was accepted or not from just the last election until that one, 
where two years before a mail-in ballot would have been rejected, but suddenly in 2020, oh no, you can accept that mail-in ballot, it's fine. And we're not allowed to say, well, wait a minute, what changed? The drop boxes all around the place where you're dropping off a ballot as if it's clothes that you're donating to homeless veterans? The multiple ballots that you were delivered, that were pushed to you in the mail, that you didn't request, but they were pushed to you. And if you went to an apartment building, you saw stacks of ballots that could be mailed in, just sitting there on a table waiting for the residents of that apartment building to pick up because the post office was too lazy to put them into the mailboxes. And I could go on and on and on. And everything I said is 100% fact-checkable and true. And all of those things were done because we had to have social distancing at the polling places because of COVID-19. All of those things were pushed through as new protocols for the election because we couldn't have people standing in line and passing the virus back and forth to each other if they weren't maintaining eight feet or six feet or whatever it was they had to maintain. And that protocol, the six foot social distancing protocol that motivated all of those changes and the way we've always done elections in this country, that protocol was a complete and total fraud. The six foot social distancing mandate that was implemented nationwide that triggered these unprecedented voting protocols that had never been done before in this country, and please God will never be done again. That protocol was just hatched out of the day. You, you know how I know that? Anthony Fauci said it. Anthony Fauci said he doesn't know where it came from. Am I a, suddenly an election denier and I'm not welcome on the panel at The View? God, I hope so. Let's let Sonny Hostin have the final reasonable word on this. As such champions of first, and I do love that they're all like, well, it's true, we do need more voices on the panel, but just not the voices that we don't like or disagree with. It's like, you either want more voices or you don't, ladies. But no, they still want to be in charge of what those voices are allowed to say. So this whole fraudulent argument on behalf of free speech is completely rooted in a lie from the very beginning. Oh, don't get me wrong. I agree that we need more representation and more voices here. But I and my friends want to be the ones who decide what those voices can actually say. Then you're not really interested. Maybe you do want more voices, but you don't want to hear what those voices have to say. And honestly, that's kind of the root of it, isn't it? There was also other sketchy things that happened, um, and she was a direct part of it. You know, I think when journalism is shrinking, especially on linear television, to pay a woman like that $300,000 is obscene. And let's remember that she was the person involved in the 2020 phone call to pressure Michigan County officials yep. to not certify the vote from the Detroit area in particular. Detroit, uh, the Detroit population is 77.8% black. I am shocked that Sonny Hostin decided to inject race into the conversation. It's true. Wayne County, Michigan, where I was born, is predominantly a black voting community. It's also where the majority of the votes are. You remove Wayne County, Michigan from the equation and Donald Trump won the state. There was an intense scrutiny on the Detroit area and Wayne County in particular, not because the voters are black, it's because the voters are numerous. And it's a lot easier to steal an election. But it's okay, Sonny. That won't be the case in this next election. No, they'll be looking a little outside the city of Detroit. It's going to be Dearborn. Dearborn, Michigan, that's all they care about now. You've lost some moxie there, Sonny, you and your friends, while you weren't looking. You've dropped one more tear down on the intersectionality ladder 
that is the power base of the Democratic Party. Sorry. We all woke up this morning to an unbelievable scene out of Baltimore, Maryland, as the Francis Scott Key Bridge uh, collapsed after a collision with a freight ship. Now, I want you to look at this video. Surely you've seen it by now. Uh, this is the beginning portion of the video that is sped up, all right? And as you can see, here at uh, 1.15 in the morning, I want to say, well, 1.24 in the morning, there you go, uh, you can see the ship coming here and the power loss that it suffered. Now, it's still drifting, all right? I'm going to pause it here. You're also going to see on the expanse of the bridge a lot of cars crossing that bridge. Uh, this is uh, I-695. They call it the Baltimore Beltway. D.C. has a beltway. That's 495. Up in Baltimore, they have a beltway. It's called 695, and it circumnavigates the city of Baltimore. But in this area, it's the uh, uh, it's a river. It's a river off the Chesapeake Bay that forms the Boston Harbor. And the only way you can circle Baltimore is either through tunnel or bridge. Now, there is a tunnel there as well. Uh, but for various reasons, you got to have a bridge, too, because there's certain trucks that won't work in a tunnel that you don't want in a tunnel either, by the way. So uh, it's a very, very highly trafficked bridge. And as you can see, when the ship loses its power and maybe even suffered engine failure, they're still looking into it. It just keeps drifting. Now, it's somehow recovered and it's turned its power back on. But now you can see as it turns its power back on, it seems to steer itself right into the pylon structure holding up the bridge. It loses its power a second time. And then as cars continue to drive across the bridge, but fewer, thankfully, at this moment. Oh, absolute devastation. I'm going to let this play on a loop here. There is no sound. It's a harrowing thing to watch. You can also see flashing lights on the bridge because there were construction crews. Uh, this bridge was built in the early 70s. It was officially named Francis Scott Key in 1976 as part of the bicentennial to commemorate uh, the fact that right near there, about 100 feet from there, there's a buoy painted red, white, and blue. It marks where the ship was that Francis Scott Key was standing on as he watched the bombardment of Baltimore Harbor and Fort McHenry. It inspired him at that moment to write the Star Spangled Banner, which is now, of course, our national anthem. It's an incredible scene. And we can only imagine what would have happened if this was during rush hour. Thank God it wasn't. And of course, immediately after this event, there's been incredible speculation about what went wrong here. A lot of experts, I am not one of them, uh, have questioned why this happened in the first place. There's a lot of protocols in place to keep this sort of thing from happening. Uh, by the way, speaking of Francis Scott Key and the Star Spangled Banner, uh, by dawn's early light, this was the scene. Just at the crack of dawn, as you can see from the pink hue on the ocean, or on the, the bay, excuse me, you can see the incredible wreckage there in Baltimore. The cargo ship, by the way, the Dolly, is under Singaporean registration. Um, but I suspect as things start to be uncovered that uh, like most Singapore companies and certainly like the vast majority of sea freighters, there's probably some Chinese investment in this company as well. Because of that and because of other aspects of this, there was immediate speculation that perhaps this was a terror attack or that in some way this was deliberate. We don't know that. The FBI and law enforcement jumped out in front of cameras and microphones to try to put a damper on that and say there's no indication that this was a terror attack, although it also seems pretty early to be that definitive, doesn't it? It should be investigated. And as usual, the initial reports on something like this, if anyone dares to try to speculate, uh, will end up being found wrong. That's what happens whenever there's a mass shooting event and people immediately start thinking that it's a crazy white right wing 
uh, angry man who wants to just kill anybody of color. And of course, it ends up not being the case in the vast majority of the time. So we don't know. We really don't know. But there have been questions that deserve to be answered. For instance, when a ship of this size makes its way in and out of a busy harbor, an incredibly busy harbor, there are pilots involved, there are tugboats involved, and there are protocols in place if something goes wrong, as clearly something did go wrong here, to keep a disaster from happening. I heard from experts during my morning show, my radio show today that said, listen, if you if something like this happens and you've got a failure and clearly this ship suffered some kind of failure, as every bit of evidence shows us, if you've lost control of the ship, which clearly they did lose control, you drop anchor. You drop anchor right then and there. That keeps you from drifting into a bridge like this. But we don't have the answers. We don't know whether that occurred or not. What we do know is this is very rare. This sort of thing doesn't happen, right? Do you remember a time when ships were just plowing into bridges like this in America and causing bridge collapses? Of course not. I don't. Now, Democrats who just want to make sure that more tax dollars are taken from your wallet and spent on so-called infrastructure projects will say, well, this is just because of neglect of our crumbling infrastructure. No, it's not. That bridge wasn't crumbling. It wasn't collapsing. There wasn't a deterioration there. This has nothing to do with infrastructure. This has to do with basic know-how and protocols on what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to operate at times like this. This isn't about infrastructure. This is about competence. Which brings us to the Secretary of Transportation. Now, I want to be sure to tell you that there is no evidence at all to suggest that what happened last night in Baltimore, Maryland, is a direct result of incompetence in the Department of Transportation under the watchful direction of Secretary Pete Buttigieg, whose job up until this point in government was to be the mayor of the fourth largest city in Indiana, South Bend, which, as far as I know, has no traversable waterways of any kind. And as mayor of South Bend, his greatest transportation challenge had to do with making sure potholes were filled on a regular basis. And I'm told he didn't even do that very well. But Pete Buttigieg is in charge of the Transportation Department in the United States of America. And up until the last year or so, Pete Buttigieg pretty much defined his role as Secretary of Transportation, not on making sure that our waterways were safely traversed and that planes were flying in a safe and orderly and expedited fashion, or the trains stayed on their tracks. No, 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 no. His claim to fame was to say that there was inherent racism in expressways, freeways, and overpasses in this country. If an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach, or it would have been, uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, but that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. Um, I don't think we have anything to lose by confronting that simple reality. And I think we have everything to gain by acknowledging it and then dealing with it, which is why the reconnecting communities, that billion dollars, is something we want to get to work right away. Yeah, that was the priority. Uh, but I'm not being fair. That wasn't his only priority. Let's not forget, he was also interested in making sure that the Earth's temperature stayed at the level that I guess he and his friends from South Bend decided it had to stay at. You know, whenever people talk about global warming and that the Earth is getting hotter, they can never answer a basic question. What is the optimal temperature for this planet? What, what are we aiming for here? But Pete Buttigieg knows that it's too hot. And therefore, as Secretary of Transportation, he's going to do whatever he can to make sure that he fixes that problem. Climate, climate is not nonsense. Dealing with climate change is one of the biggest things that people like me and people like him will be remembered for after we're gone. And climate, climate is not. Uh, that's not entirely true, Pete. You're going to be remembered for this. 
I'm still surprised that some people were surprised when I pointed to the fact that uh, if a highway was built for the purpose of di dividing a white and a black neighborhood, or if an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach, or it would have been, uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, but that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. Um, He'll be remembered as a punchline, as a smug narcissist playing to the liberal Marxist left in this country, as the really good guy, nice guy who's so smart and he really pushes back and tells it like it is. Because, yes, you betcha expressways are racist and bridges are racist and overpasses are racist. And that's what we want out of our Department of Transportation. Again, I'm not saying that this bridge collapse is his fault. But if you have this sinking feeling in this country that that the basics are no longer being attended to, that things that we used to take for granted are now crumbling around us. And at the same time, we were told that people like this guy were the smart ones, the grown-ups, right? Everything in the Trump administration, they were amateurs. It was chaotic in the Trump administration. Now we've got the Ivy Leagues back in charge. We've got the grownups back in charge. We've got the competent ones back in charge. And he's the poster child for that. And so let's take a look at Pete Buttigieg's record as the Secretary of Transportation. Again, not saying that he's responsible for all of these things. But we've got doors falling off of airplanes mid-flight. We've got wheels falling off of airplanes at takeoff. We've got train derailments, including catastrophic chemical spills of train derailments in East Palestine, Ohio, and all across the country. And now we've got a ship going through a harbor and under a bridge that since literally before Pete Buttigieg was born, there was nary an incident. But now suddenly, not because of infrastructure, not because of racism, not because of climate change, but because the basic protocols that we have all known we're supposed to follow on a daily basis in mundane things like piloting a ship in and out of a harbor, suddenly somehow that got overlooked, it appears. And I'm not saying Pete Buttigieg is responsible for it. What I'm saying is this didn't happen before. And yet this guy keeps getting a pass. This guy is the best and brightest. This guy's phenomenal. I I'll tell you this. This I do know for sure. I done enough with the speculation. Enough with the, I don't know, maybe Pete Buttigieg should have done something better. Maybe he should have focused on making sure our harbors are safe instead of focusing on racist overpasses and climate change, enough with the maybes. I will tell you this definitively. If this happened, if this string of events happened, the events that I just laid out that have happened under Pete Buttigieg, not to mention, not to mention two other major things, billions of dollars allocated to install brand new, electric vehicle chargers, and what, a half a dozen have actually been installed? Where's all the money, Pete? And let's not forget the fiasco of the supply chain crisis that started this administration that he seemed completely clueless about. If all of those things happened during the Trump presidency, I guarantee you, no speculation at all, the transportation secretary would have been forced to resign by the media at the very least, but probably by Donald Trump. But no, I'm sure everything's fine in this country because after all, the grownups are back in charge. And I mean, everything is so much better now, three years in. Thank God we got rid of the bad orange man from our border to crime in our streets, to our economy, to inflation, to national security, our ally Israel, Eastern Europe, NATO, China, the South Pacific, 
our military morale and recruitment, everything's better because the grown-ups are in charge. That's it for today. I want to finish up once again by saying that despite our political commentary about the disaster in Baltimore, the actual real human beings that are affected by this disaster, they need our prayers and they deserve our prayers. And it's the best we can do is to pray for them and their families as this rescue and recovery effort continues. And thank God for the incredible first responders who are doing work that I can't even imagine being done right now in the cold waters of Baltimore Harbor. Thank you. Thank you, man. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same place. Thanks for watching. My name's Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. <laughs>